I've been working on the nuclear weapons issue for more than half my life. And I've been doing it because nuclear weapons to me were the worst thing I'd ever learned about. They're the worst wrong that I had ever come across. And the reason I felt that way is, is actually a human rights reason. Um, I, came ac I met some people whose families were forcibly displaced in order for the United States to do nuclear testing. So this whole nation that has a treaty with the US government were removed from their territorial homeland mm -hmm. at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. So the United States could blow up nuclear bombs. And I was appalled. And I said, well, that's, that's just so wrong. How could this wrong, wrong, wrong thing be allowed to continue? And I believe in the good in people. I believe that given the opportunity, people will choose to do the right thing. So I thought, well, let me find a way to help people see that in themselves and choose to do something other than nuclear weapons. So that was a long, a long while ago. <laughs> and it was really um, a very exciting start to my engagement with the issue because working with indigenous people helped me find a way into this issue uh -huh. that I felt like I could contribute. And also, um, I was not alone doing something that stood for, for peace and for justice. And I felt like we could, we could actually make a difference because we're rooted in those, those core human rights principles. And so I was, I was working with this organization called the Sundahai Network. And that's a, came, it was led by a traditional leader from the Shoshone Nation. And after several years working there, I um, decided to go back to New York and, and sort of figure out where to take this issue to the global level. And so I started to work with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and that gave me a place to voice also my strong feminism um, and to really take a look at the disarmament issue from a global perspective, um, to engage with decision makers at the UN which was different than engaging in the very local level in, in Nevada or in the national level in Washington. Uh, and it gave me a chance to, to explore the opportunities um, for what was possible. And so I was with Wilp for nearly a decade. Mm -hmm. And we saw some great things happen during that time, including the Convention on Cluster Munitions and, um, and some real progress in the, the concept of humanitarian disarmament. Mm -hmm. It's really exciting. Everybody's got another story on how the ban treaty happened. And I think I bring it back to the change in the way we look at nuclear weapons. And that was embodied in international documents after the um, then president of the International Committee of the Red Cross, Jacob Kellenberger, addressed the Geneva Dis Diplomatic Corps in, I guess it would have been early 2010. And he talked about nuclear weapons as bombs, as weapons. He talked about the impact that they have. He talked about the humanitarian catastrophe that could not be avoided, mm -hmm. even by using one tiny weapon. Mm -hmm. and I think that inspired some activity. It, it inspired a lot of backroom discussions that led to the inclusion of language in the 2010 NPT outcome document recognizing the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. And that built up, and the focus changed from tools of security and stability to human beings are destroyed by nuclear weapons, either in the immediate, by the flash and the fireball that incinerates the body, or in the longer term, by the, the impact of the ionizing radiation that will eat us up from within. Nuclear weapons are catastrophic to humanity and catastrophic to life on this planet. And people started to talk about that. And within ICANN, we made a decision to focus on that. Focus on what this weapon does to people. And that's how we got the treaty. Yeah, and so in 2010, we had this NPT outcome document. And you know, the NPT is almost every country participates, and um, it's, it's nearly universal, but it's, it's a bit flawed. Some can have nuclear weapons as long as they eventually get rid of them, and everyone else can't. And the focus is about maintaining a balance. But there was this language on humanitarian consequences. And that led to a statement in 2012 NPT preparatory committee meeting led by the Swiss. Mm -hmm. um, and there's about a dozen governments. 
that said, wait, any use of nuclear weapons causes catastrophic humanitarian consequences. And there's a couple of key words in there. Catastrophic, because nuclear weapons are catastrophic, and any use. Mm -hmm. So that started to delegitimize the weapon as a security tool and put the emphasis on the weapon as a weapon. That led to some, some further discussions in Norway said, well, you know, at the 2010 MPT, we agreed that all countries would do everything they could for nuclear disarmament. Let's do something. Let's, let's put some emphasis on the, the consequences. And Norway decided to hold the first ever, ever, in the history of nuclear weapons, Norway held the first ever conference among governments on the impact of nuclear weapons the humanitarian impact. That was March 2013, cold and bitter in Oslo, and uh, warmly welcomed by the global community. I think it was 130 governments that participated there. So Oslo conference took place, and, um, and we were quite excited. And at the end of the Oslo conference, the government of Mexico said, we will do the next one. And we'll hold it around the anniversary of the Treaty of Tlaloco, which for those of us in the, the Western Hemisphere celebrate as Valentine's Day. Um, it's our love letter to disarmament, um, this first treaty that banned nuclear weapon for a populated area. And so Mexico hosted the Nayarit Conference and declared it was a point of no return. It almost put Austria off hosting the, the conference after that, but they did it anyway. And so Austria held the third conference on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons, which recognized there was no way to deal with it and we have to do something about it. And at that conference, the Austrian government, in their own name, issued a pledge to work with anyone willing to do everything they could to stigmatize, outlaw, and eliminate nuclear weapons and not necessarily in that order. And other governments soon decided to join on. And more and more governments joined the pledge. And then that led to, that was in advance of the 2015 NPT Review Conference, which ended without an outcome document, um, but did reaffirm the agreements made in 2010. Um, and then, then what? What are we gonna do? There's no, nothing on the horizon. So at the General Assembly, later that year, um, government said, well, let's, let's make some progress. And so they agreed, let's put together an open-ended working group. It's a very complicated way to say, we'll have a bunch of meetings <laughs> where we're gonna talk about what we can do to get rid of nuclear weapons. So they set up a bunch of meetings in 2016 that came with some recommendations. And one of the core recommendations was to start negotiations on a new treaty to ban nuclear weapons. It was very contentious, it's always contentious, um, but it was also extremely logical. And it was decided at that meeting to put that recommendation forward. And the General Assembly, when it met later that year in 2016, took a vote. We're gonna start negotiations on a new treaty. And they did. <laughs> and in 2017, it seems like forever ago, but it wasn't. <laughs> 2017, they started negotiations. In March of 2017, and wow, we finished and in July. That, and that's how we got the treaty. And that's how we got the treaty. <laughs> Ooh, and a lot of hard work. I don't want to discount, though. That's the government side of what happened. But behind the scenes and in the streets and through creative actions, people have been pushing and pushing and pushing to make sure this happened. This wasn't just a couple of people in suits mm -hmm. saying, oh, let's have some meetings. This was the power of people saying nuclear weapons are wrong. Governments have to do something, mm -hmm. and they are accountable to us. Mm -hmm. So we're going to make them do something. So I think that there's, there's more to the story yeah. than what we saw in the government meetings. Yeah. Sure. So here in the Netherlands, we decided we wanted to take up this issue, and, and the, our organization was one of the drivers of the the movement against the Pershing missiles in the seven, mm -hmm. in the 80s, 70s and 80s. And we got you know, a million people on the streets of Amsterdam. And today's type of organizing is a bit different. And we recognize that, but there are still tools available to us. So um, my, my colleagues put together the most amazing campaign that was in Dutch, it's uh, Taken Taken Kernwapens, which is Sign Against Nuclear Weapons. Mm -hmm. Because the Dutch political system allows you to put any issue that hasn't been otherwise debated on the parliamentary agenda if you get enough signatures. And we got more than enough signatures. 
So we got over 45,000 signatures calling for a national ban on nuclear weapons. And the parliament debated a national ban on nuclear weapons, said no, that's too far, um, but will encourage the government uh, to participate in any international discussions without prejudice to the outcome, without prejudging. And because of that resolution, because of that motion that was supported overwhelmingly by the parliament, when the negotiations for the ban treaty came up, the government couldn't say no. Mm. It was bound. Democracy worked. <laughs> and they had to be there. Of course, at the end of the day, they were unhappy with the treaty. And they voted against yeah. the treaty. And in further conversations, the real reason, they voted against the treaty because they are currently violating the treaty. Mm -hmm. There are nuclear weapons in the Netherlands, and the treaty prohibits a country from accepting the stationing of nuclear weapons in their territory. So the government's not ready to join onto a treaty that it's violating. Sure. So we've got some more work to do. Yeah. So um, I sit in the ICANN steering group, mm -hmm. and we had talked earlier the week, um, in the week of the Nobel announcement, oh, we should get ready in case, the, in case we win the Nobel Prize. And I said, well, I, I was one of the people who said, no, I mean, we prepared a few things last year, but let's not be ridiculous, you know, let's not go overboard. Just, you know, hold your horses. It'll be fine. I'm sure it's going to be some very well-deserving person or organization. Um, so there was always still this hope. And also we heard a rumor that you get a phone call a half an hour beforehand, uh -huh. which is not true. It's only five minutes. <laughs> So, <laughs> so really, after, you know, when it was 10.30 in the morning before the 11 o'clock announcement, nobody, I hadn't gotten a message. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, all right, we didn't get it. Um, but so sitting in this meeting with some people from a think tank and the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs talking about what to do next on nuclear weapons. And of course, as you do when it's like the end of the meeting, you're checking your phone, kind of looking at, okay, what's next, what's next, what's next. And then I saw, <laughs> like, I can wins Nobel Peace Prize. And I threw my phone <laughs> across the table at my colleague from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and said, can you check that? I think we just won the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> and he just looked at me and he, he was, his phone was ringing. He answered his phone and he said, you did, congratulations. And then we both just picked up our phones and started calling because there was press stuff to do. There was, you know, announcements. He got a tweet out um, from the government of the Netherlands immediately congratulating ICANN. Really? One of the only NATO countries that did congratulate ICANN. I really appreciate that. Something. It was very nice. Then we had to like run for buses because we were in the boondocks of the Hague. <laughs> and so running for buses, we totally got on the wrong bus. And there was frantic phone calls and calling my director. Camera crews went to my director's house to interview really? him. And we had immediately arranged this big celebration. We had a nice big party um, here in our office, also with more camera crews because we had a wonderful media frenzy. Uh -huh. And the headlines were... Um, Nobel Peace Prize comes to Utrecht. Uh -huh. A little bit. <laughs> Which is exactly what it was. Yeah. And it's such a great thing because we get to celebrate as a campaign uh -huh. of 500 organizations in 100 countries. And like, how many thousands of ICANN campaigners got a note from their high school, like, so, you know, politics pro teachers or, or science professors saying, congratulations, yeah. you know. It's ours yeah. as a group, and it's such a, it's such a cool thing. I'm, I'm so proud to be part of it. So I've been working on nuclear weapons for about half, well, more than half my life now. <laughs> um, and it's hard work, and it's very disempowering. Nuclear weapons are the worst weapon that was ever created, and they're often seen as something only experts and maybe some select politicians in a few countries have the right to talk about. And I think that's completely wrong. So wanted, I wanted to change that. I wanted to think about a way that uh, everyone can get involved. And we can. We can talk to politicians, but it's important for us to think about what we can do personally. So we decided to, to come up to do some stuff around the issue of the way nuclear weapons are financed. Because people might not know this, but private companies make key components for nuclear weapons. And in order for them to be able to do that, they need financing from banks mm -hmm. and pension funds. People profit mm -hmm. from the production of nuclear weapons. This was a little bit surprising. And so we start up with the Don't Bank on the Bomb. And what Don't Bank on the Bomb does 
is it gives everyone a pathway to resist nuclear weapons. So what we do is we talk about, we publish information, free and open to anyone. What are the companies that are involved in the production of nuclear weapons? What are the banks and pension funds, asset managers, insurance companies that provide them with the financing they need? And how much? And we make it public. Not only that, but we also recognize not everybody is trying to profit from, the, from nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. There are some that are actually doing real good, mm -hmm. that have really strong policies that say we will not be touched and we will not let our money touch anything to do with the nuclear bomb. So we also publish information about those um, because people need good examples too. But the great thing about Don't Bank the Bomb is if you have a bank account, mm -hmm. you can do something about nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. You can talk to your bank and ask them, do they have a policy on investment? If you have a pension fund, is your pension fund profiting from the production of nuclear weapons? And if they are, why? Mm -hmm. You have a right as a consumer, you have power mm -hmm. to do something, to change that. And people are. And as soon as we started publishing this, people started to get nervous. Their, their investments were exposed. And we're shining a light on that. And I think that's really important. And we've seen very positive changes. But it's not huge, 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 huge numbers of people and massive demonstrations that are making the change. It's a handful of people writing on the Facebook page of a bank in Sweden then catching the eye of somebody in their communications department who sends a message out, hey, can we do something? This is bad PR. Mm -hmm. And then one person in the bank's like, oh, wait, I think we can, mm -hmm. and writes a policy and fixes it. Mm -hmm. 10 people yeah, yeah. can move millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And it's a powerful act because we keep seeing success. We keep seeing pension funds like ABP here in the Netherlands last year as we're gearing up and planning for our next step in the campaign, they just announced, oh yeah, we're not going to invest in nuclear weapon producers anymore. The Norwegian pension fund, the largest in the world, trillions that fund controls. Nope, not touching nuclear weapons anymore. And they cite different things. It's a humanitarian concern because they're actually bombs that kill people, yeah. um, or because of pressure from their clients or because it's not necessarily the most profitable investment. There's other companies you can invest and make a decent return. Um, or, you know, they just want to, at least they say they just want to do the right thing. Mm. Um, what we've seen in the, since the treaty was adopted, though, is that more financial institutions are citing the treaty uh -huh. as a reason to divest because nuclear weapons will be illegal under international law and they don't want to risk being exposed financially to the production of something that's illegal. Sure. So that's a great tool. Well, with the Don't Bank on the Bomb, um, we launched this year's report in March. And so it was about several months after we had been awarded the prize and the shine was still on. Uh, and it opened a lot of doors for us. It meant that we could get meetings with vice presidents at Citigroup. It meant that we could, you know, get into the the, the world of high finance um, with this nice, you know, hello, we have a Nobel Prize, can we talk to you? And that's been great. Uh, they haven't all changed policies yet, um, but they're talking to us. They recognize the concerns. They're looking for ways to do the right thing. And again, they come back to the treaty. As this treaty enters into force, when nuclear weapons are completely illegal, they see, oh yeah, governments are also saying, well, so is financing the weapons, so let's get ahead of the game. You know, financiers want to be ahead of markets. Sure. So they're, they're looking for that. So it's been great in opening doors and giving us um, attention mm -hmm. to the issue. And it's been, a, it's been an, a tough year for nuclear weapons in a lot of ways. There's been quite a lot more threats. And the, so the issue has been in the, in the public eye more than it has in a long time. And I think the Nobel Prize means that our solution to the problem of nuclear weapons, outlaw and eliminate, mm -hmm. is seen and dealt with as, a, as an honest solution and not just some crazy idea of a bunch of, of people. But this is, this is now treaty. Mm -hmm.
this is now an option. This is something we can move forward with. So it helped, uh, helped a lot of ways like that, too. So in the, the pathway to produce nuclear weapons, you have the you know, manufacturing, you also have testing and development. And in order to test nuclear weapons, primarily they've been tested on the lands of indigenous people. They've been tested on the lands of those without power. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's deliberate. Also, the, the key components, the toxic components, always made in communities of color mm -hmm. and in, la in areas where it was, the people were seen as politically uh, not valuable, not, not that important. And so the treaty recognizes the disproportionate impact that nuclear weapons have had on certain communities and that they've prevented people from attaining their full human rights. Mm -hmm. And I'm really quite pleased at the language in the treaty on victim assistance and the recognition of human rights because it gives um, space for those who have been directly impacted to seek redress from governments, to ask the international community for help. And I was, last year, I went to the Trinity site. They do an open day. And I, I've been working on nuclear weapons a long time. I'm, a bit of, I'm quite interested in it. I wanted to see the first place a bomb was ever blown up. And I did. And as we were leaving the site, my friend and I saw some people outside with signs. And it was a community group that, of people who had been affected, they're physically affected by that very first nuclear weapons explosion. So I stopped and talked to them and said, you know, ask people to tell their stories. People had been displaced. People had, you know, long-term illnesses, um, lost family members, horrible miscarriages, child deformities, all of these things that we know can be directly tied to nuclear weapons explosions. And I said, well, do you know about this ban treaty? Do you know about ICANN? And I said, of course we do. <laughs> we see ourselves in the treaty. We see the treaty to, as a way to help us mm -hmm get all of our human rights, which have been denied to us until now. And for me, that was just, that was amazing. I'm really and constantly inspired by the people I get to work with. Because people who choose to spend their energy on nuclear weapons are not seeking fame and fortune. <laughs> uh, they're seeking to make the world better for themselves and for coming generations. They're taking a long view and they're doing it with creativity and confidence and dedication and a fierce, fierce determination to do what is right and what is good. And, you know, sometimes we do make uh, some mistakes, but we learn from them. So I, I really draw my inspiration from the community of people I get to work with, mm -hmm. my colleagues, and their creativity and compassion as well. Yeah, so I did have a child um, and in a, that did change the way I look at the future and it actually made me a bit more pessimistic than right. I was because now I have a physical connection to the next generation mm -hmm. in a way before it was very theoretical. Um, and that said though, I, I'm optimistic that the good nature of people will win in the end. And it's amazing. I mean, when you talk to a human being, even somebody who defends nuclear weapons in public, you talk to them on a personal level, on a human level, and they say, you know, is this the right, really the right thing to do? I'd say 98% of the time, they'll agree with you privately. Nuclear weapons are insane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so just giving, finding ways to, to build that confidence that they can say that publicly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm, I know that the, the good um, can win through. And it has to. Because if it doesn't, then we're all doomed. And that's going to suck. So, <laughs> you know. Um, I, yeah, I'd say I'm, I'm kind of an optimist. Very good. I'm, I'm very hopeful.